with Derek Mitchell. All right, so we can go ahead and get officially started. So uh, I did kind of, so I've listened to you guys' music. After I listened to it the first time, uh, that's when I asked you guys if you'd be interested in doing this interview. And I've listened to it probably four more times after that all the way through. Just just to take notes and whatnot. And uh, so listening to your guys' music, uh, you guys have a lot of different influences. Now, you guys are, you know, a lot younger than me. So I was surprised, especially with one of the things that I think, one of the bands I think has a little bit of an influence on you. So I'm going to go ahead and straight guess it. It was for one particular song. But uh, I think it was the song called uh, Love of Two. Now, I heard two different influences on that one, and uh, so I'll go ahead and say it, and you tell me if I'm right or wrong, but uh, uh, System of a Down was one of them, and uh, then Black Sabbath was another huge, like, a uh, huge uh, taste I heard in that. Am I uh, right? Did you guys yeah. listen to Black Sabbath? I've never heard that before, and actually, I'm not a super avid listener of Black Sabbath, but I do like System of a Down a lot. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, there was definitely a handful of influence of that in there. It was, yeah, it was a collection of influences, especially on C section. That, like you said, that album has a lot of different influences. Yeah, the al- yeah, the album specifically was yeah. not. I, when I say all over the place, I don't mean like uh, those songs didn't fit in an album, like in a in like an artist sense. You know, if it was in a museum, it would all make sense. But like right. the influences on each songs uh, came from far and wide. It felt like. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of my favorite parts about writing like an album, especially in putting a project together. Is like, I don't know. I think it, it's honestly it comes more natural um, than anything else. Like it's not like I'm writing a song and I'm like, okay, this one needs to be like Black Sabbath. It just kind of like, like flows into that, and normally it works. Sometimes it doesn't. So. Yeah, yeah. So let's get into that. So before we uh, move on into like the writing process, because I ha- I do have a particular question about that. Let's just go ahead and introduce your guys' selves, right? So, for the, for the people listening. Go ahead, Brandon. Uh, my name is Brandon Crook, and I play drums for Sweet Spine. Uh, my name is Taylor Priola, and I play bass for Sweet Spine. And then my name is Fox Haynes, and I play guitar and sing in Sweet Spine. Yeah, sweet. So, how did you guys... Well, so I'll ask... Well, maybe this will lead into it. So, how did each of you uh, kind of start playing music? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, you guys can go. Brandon's story is pretty funny. Yeah, yeah. Brandon, let's well, start I, with you. Yeah, I, yeah. I was in high school in like freshman year, and I didn't really have anything going on. Like, <laughs> like all day, like eight, ten hours. And I was like, man, this kind of sucks. Like, this is depressing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we were in this like sort of small neighborhood and the guy across the street actually was running a percussion studio out of his garage. Wow. I never really grew up idolizing drummers or whatever. My dad played guitar, so he always wanted me to play guitar, but I never really caught on. Um, but I, I went there once a week for, I don't even know how long. And I just sort of fell in love with it after the fact, you know, and then I went back and listened to all the bands I had been listening to for the drums. And it was just a really interesting like learning experience going back and like, seeing all that art in a completely different light and mm-hmm. everything I do is drums. So I'm very happy that, uh, that guy was living across the street. Yeah. That's, that's a <laughs> wild, like, you know, what were the chances that I, some I, neighbor I fell into music and now it's like, I mean, it's all I could ever want it to be. So. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Taylor, what about you? Um, so I originally started playing cello in fourth grade and then as I got more into it, the music that I was listening to at the time, which is just like super like emo, like middle school era music, yeah, I really couldn't reflect that sound. And I really liked bass, and I thought it was cool, and also it was like the most similar to cello, being in bass class and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. So I started playing bass in sixth grade. I started going to a school of rock, if you know what that is. No. It's like a little music program for kids. Oh, and really? these little bands and you cover like Metallica and stuff oh, like that. Oh, that's cool, yeah. Yeah, and so I kept playing that. I kept playing cello too until I was like a junior in high school and I just liked bass more and it stuck. Yeah. Yeah, you don't really see, well, well now you do, but back in, uh, back when I, my, my day when I started playing bass and stuff, there weren't like any 
female bass players. I, I do have a question for that once we get more into like the music stuff, but uh, Fox, what about you? How did you start? Yeah, so uh, it was a super early development for me musically. Um, like I was pretty much born being surrounded by music, like my father uh, is super into music. Uh, he's always got music going in the house, and my mom too. Like they're just very, they just love music in general. Um, so I was always listening to music, uh, like since the day I was born, but I, um, started picking up the piano, I think when I was probably about six ish, uh, and my dad would just kind of teach me little things here and there. And over time, I just kind of developed a love for playing it. And like, I remember being like nine years old and like my dad was overseas, uh, he was a Marine and I remember like missing him so bad and like writing songs about missing him and like wanting to hang out with him and like. So I've always been writing and playing music, like, since I was little. And it's always been my, like, kind of calling. Um, so it was piano then, and then I didn't pick up the guitar until I was, like, 13. Yeah. And then that's when I really started to, like, get into rock and stuff like that. Like, Nirvana was one of the first rock bands. Yeah, I yeah, I've noticed a lot of Nirvana, <laughs> uh, specifically yeah. with the song, uh, not to cut you off, but since, since you mentioned yeah, no it, specifically with the song Thorns, had a very yeah, Nirvana... So uh, Nirvana yeah, feel to it. It's a very Nevermind influence song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I thought it was really good, yeah. So you started yeah. playing guitar at 13, and then... Yeah, I started playing guitar at 13, and I've always been writing my own music, but then at some point, I think I was... It was probably, like, my junior, senior year, I really, really got serious about, like, wanting to start a band. Yeah. Um, and so I just... Yeah, it just kind of happened. Yeah. So how did you guys get together then after that so uh, originally we had a completely different lineup uh it was just through mutuals i had found some friends uh like drummer bass player and another guitarist who were looking for a drummer or i'm sorry it was a singer a guitarist and a another bass player who were looking for a drummer so they called me and i was like well i don't really play the drums but sure why not so i went in there and played the drums and i was like honestly, like, y'all kind of suck. Would y'all want to, like, play this instead? And I showed them my songs, and they were like, oh, hell yeah, like, let's do that. So we kind of started Sweet Spine from there. And then just as time went on, there was always, like, a conflict of interest because they were in school or getting a job or, you know, just moving on with their life, and I just still wanted to do music. So, uh, you know, through time, uh, I met Brandon through Mutuals because he was in another band that the old version of Sweet Spine used to play with a ton locally. Um, so when we needed a drummer, he was like the first guy I thought to call and, uh, we clicked really well in our first show together is another really interesting story, but it was a beautiful show. And then I found out about Taylor through just some concert photography that came up on my Instagram and I was like, I don't know, to me, the idea of a female bassist is just so badass and I wanted that to be a part of Peace Fine, you know, so like I didn't want to have a regular like just chill dude basis with super long hair. Like <laughs> yeah. I wanted it to be a girl. So when I saw Taylor, I was like, bingo. Yeah, yeah. I was going to ask, uh, does um, do you guys feel like uh, having a? Well, have you guys listened to uh, Courtney Laplante's podcast? Uh, she's from, she's from, uh, you know, Spirit Box. Oh yeah, she's the lead singer for that. And during COVID, she had a, a podcast called uh, "Good for a Girl," and she talked about the dynamics of like what's it like uh, being a female in the music industry, not just in a band, right. but uh, you know, if you're booking agencies and recording uh, companies and stuff like that. <clears throat> um, but she didn't really talk about like the dynamics of having a female when it comes to the music creating process so uh we'll go ahead and, and dive into that now I, I do have one specific question so this is kind of two questions so like do you guys think having a female plays a different role especially i'm a bass player so like I, you know i'm kind of biased so does a female bass player play a different role in the band than, than like, uh, a, 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 instead of it all being just dudes, you know, basically. Right, yeah. No, I think that's a super solid question, and I think what it ultimately comes down to is, like, at the end of the day, boy or girl, whatever you call yourself, like, you can play the bass mm -hmm. and play the bass just fine. Um, but, like, for example, where Taylor really makes a difference and, like, 
this is not it has nothing to do with if Taylor's a boy or a girl it's just really her as a character and as a person but it's like she's super intelligent when it comes to like creative direction when it comes to marketing when it comes to business she she brings to the table an entirely new set of tools for us to you know use as resources when it comes to growing our band yeah. so know, it's kind of like like our previous bassist was also a girl but all she really did was play the bass so she was very, very replaceable in that sense so in all honesty no i don't think it makes a huge difference i think it really is what it what they bring to the table yeah and Taylor just brings more to the table than we're willing to ever lose. So yeah, she, cool. Yeah, she brings a lot. Yeah, bass players tend to uh, put their fingers in different aspects of music to really yeah. like hold their hold. You know, yes. stay their foot exactly. in the band. Really, that's that's exactly. kind of the a lot of bass players. Uh, their secondary instrument is usually piano. Just from the music theory side, mm-hmm. you can learn so much from that. And then when you're not that I use a lot of music theory when I'm making my, my bass parts. I usually write bass first and then guitar over top of that, so it's totally backwards. But, uh, but you know, just learning, just having that a little bit of knowledge, if I play this note instead of this note, now right. it has like this eerie feeling to it. So, right. But this right. kind of leads us into uh, one of the questions. So like, um, it seems that Darkness uh, is your biggest song right now, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. so... I think so. The, so, what was the what was the writing process like before Darkness came out? Uh, yeah. And what was the writing process like for uh, Darkness? And then after Darkness, has it changed? Right. Yeah, that's a really good question, actually. So, I'm trying to think if you'll give me just a couple. Minutes. No. Yeah, you're good. While, you while you're good. thinking, uh, Brandon, tell me about that first show. Uh, you you smirked. Yeah. It's so cool. It's such a cool story. Yeah. That was a fun- Fun time. So at, at the time, um, it was just, I, I forget, it was like a Saturday night, and I was chilling at home. I live in Greenville, South Carolina, um, and Sweet Spine at the time, I wasn't in it. They had a show in Charlotte, North Carolina, which is about two hours away, at this venue called The Milestone, like super legendary, like punk venue, a lot of really cool bands that played there. Um, and their drummer at the time was underage. I think he was 17 at the time. Oh, yeah. And they wouldn't let him into the venue, yeah. which in general and I, I i hate when venues do that but i get the liability but anyways um they because we had played a bunch of gigs together and they were like this guy's a pretty okay drummer they called me um that like the night of like a couple hours before they were supposed to go on and they were like can you play our uh, can you play our set like do you think you'd be able to and at the time i kind of like I was really teetering on not doing it because Charlotte is a two-hour drive and the show was in two hours, so it would have been wow. like speed 25, learning the songs uh, and just being stressed out. And I was like really close to not doing it. Yeah. I was with my partner that night and we were like just... That was the first night we had sat down all day. Um, so I was like, when I do this, like I really would just like stay in and <laughs> chill out for an hour. And they were like, I feel like you should probably do it. Like, it'd be pretty cool. Because at the time, I'm really starting to become like a really big thing. So I was like, well, I'd like to be able to say I played with Sweet Spine for a show, mm-hmm. not knowing that the show would turn out to be like my live. So we drove 85, the two hours up. The whole time I listened to the set twice. <laughs> or take notes on every one of the songs for me to have like in front of me as I played the songs like chorus here play this part here whatever mm-hmm. got there uh we got in the green room as a band and we like basically like played on our bodies and stuff like any any sort of form that i was confused on and then we were on in like 20 minutes and it it was it's still been my favorite show with sweet spine ever it was unbelievable and yeah. i remember being at the time i was like i didn't know shows could look like this like people were crap and like moshing like really hard and i was like i just i've seen videos of this but no show i've ever played has looked like that wow awesome really incredible and then i guess it was like a week or two later maybe maybe like a month um they were having issues with the drummer at the time it just wasn't working out there was a difference um in like availabilities and stuff like that so they were like well you basically already auditioned would you like to join and i was like hell yeah yeah (laughs) So that was fantastic. That is an awesome, and that's really a testament to your drumming too. To be able to 
do it like that. You hear stories of, you know, like uh, like big bands, you know, Metallica. Well, maybe not Metallica because they've kind of had the same people. But, uh, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, hey, come play the show for us in 24 hours. Uh, and then the, the guitar player jumps on a plane and starts going over there. And he's just listening to the songs. And in my head, I'm like... There's no way I could do that, you know, to play a whole set on songs I don't even know, you know, that's crazy. All the time, it's it's really just about being available. That's like the main thing. <laughs> like the amount of gig I've taken, like more gigs than I can count. Where it's like day of, learn the songs, go jam for a couple hours, then play the gig, and it's like it's probably the scariest part of playing music is being that unprepared. But also, it's like learning a new language in a different country yeah like a way to learn it than to just be like super high stakes you're in front of a crowd they yeah. assume like for the band mm -hmm. so but make it work and obviously it worked out for me i mean i was so close to not doing it which i think about a lot yeah like i don't know i would definitely be probably be less happy and probably be more focused on school <laughs> <laughs> yeah but got the way it did yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think it, in music or any kind of creative thing, uh, you have to make yourself vulnerable and go into those scary situations if you ever want a return on it. You know, and whether that return is financial or, you know, uh, publicity or just like personal growth. You know, you yeah. have to. You can't make a perfect song without making poor songs, good songs, and then perfect songs. You know, you might have. A thousand good songs, and then eventually make that one perfect song. But you got to do the you got to do the legwork first for sure. Exactly. So yeah, so which also leads back into that question. So like, what was the songwriting process before Darkness came out? Yeah. So okay. So I thought about it, and it's actually kind of funny because we just did another interview as a group last night. Um, this like high school kid reached out to us and was like, I love your band, and would you guys want to do this interview for me? So it's super fresh on my mind. The answer from that, but. I would say, like, as far as the writing process goes, it didn't really change much, at least for me. I think what tr truly changed because of darkness and that sort of sense of virality was my mindset going into songwriting and how, I don't know, it's kind of like, I can't lie and say that there, it's not like there's pressure now. Because when I when we do have a song that does so well, it almost feels like, damn, nothing I make is going to top this. But now we have a whole album on the way, and I feel like every song has the potential to do like tenfold what Darkness has done. Nice. So for me, the writing process is really just like, I don't know, I've never really been able to sit down and force myself to write. So like for me, Darkness just kind of came on a whim. Uh, and it was like a little demo, and I saved it. It was like right after C-Section came out, like f maybe four months after C-Section came out. Never touched it, never showed anyone. One day I showed the band and they were like, oh, that's really cool, but let's save it for blah, 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 blah. Well, then I started getting really serious about like TikTok. So I like showcased Darkness on TikTok and it blew up. And then so we kind of went into it from there. Um, but just seeing how well it did and like how much that changed our careers and our lives was like, damn, we can do this with if, if we can do this with every song or even half of the songs we write, you know, like what will that do for us? So ultimately, I feel like my mindset just changed around it more. And I feel a lot more pressure now as a writer, especially going into our next project. Um, I don't know. It's it's a weird feeling. It's just a lot of pressure. Yeah. It's almost like uh, I was talking to my buddy who's uh, he was a guitarist back in the day for our band. But uh, he's uh, he wrote uh, a paper for class and... Uh, we're old, so we're going back to school now. But uh, he wrote a paper for class, and uh, and the professor was like, "Oh, this is really good," or whatever. And then, uh, so then, so he took that like super personal, you know, like okay. So he had a rough draft due like the next week. He rewrote the rough draft like four times, and was like, oh, "I'm stressing about it," you know, like it has to be right. perfect because he's already set himself up. Right. And the professor said, "I wouldn't change a single thing on this." So oh. now he's like. Okay, now I'm even more freaking out, you know? Cause it's, but that's kind of how uh, my mindset was with uh, my EP that I put out, Empty Smiles, is that, like, I would need to put something out in order to have something to surpass next time. You know, like, set the bar and then try to get past it. 
And that's and that's kind of what I was gonna say too when you were talking about that paper thing. It really made me think like, even though that my mindset is a lot, or I feel a lot more pressure now going into the writing process. I don't think that's ever stopped me or the band from just writing what we want. Yep. Because at the end of the day, as much pressure as we do feel, like for example, like I said, darkness came on a whim like that. Like it was super random. I didn't put that much thought into it. And oftentimes, the ideas that you don't put that extra thought into are the ones that do thrive so well because you're able to just freely express and write on them. And that's when the creativity really does come out. And that's when the best products are made. Yeah, so how did you guys go about... So, like, I'm assuming that this uh, next album, which I have a question about that, singles versus album. You know, you guys are putting this stuff out, and it seems to be a big topic. Me, personally, I'm a fan of albums, but that's just probably the old head in me enjoying seeing the what the artist wanting to do with the album and how it flows and the story they're trying to right. tell or convey. But how was the writing this album? I'm assuming that all three of you guys had some input on this, especially, Brandon, since you're you know, uh, C-section and darkness was already out when you came into it. Yeah. So like, how was the writing process with like all new members kind of contributing? If you guys did contribute, I mean, I've, drums is kind of one of those things where it's like the drummer has to write the drum parts, but. Right. Yeah. Well, we're actually still in the process. So, I mean, we're pretty, this is pretty fresh for us because we were literally just at my house last night working on the upcoming album. Um, and I mean, I can't really speak too much on like, like obviously they have personal experiences they can share specifically, but on my side, I'll say that like, it's honestly been really nice for me, like yeah. to have also working with me, but I'm sure they have like their own, like very personal experiences with it. Yeah. Taylor, what about you? How do you feel about the writing process? Yeah, it's been cool to be able to collaborate as a group, especially because the previous sets that we've been playing have been like a product of fox's full mindset and creativity Mm -hmm. and so to be able to see how that is created from like the most primitive space and be able to add our input is like super special yeah yeah brandon what about you yeah i mean it's it's a really enjoyable process that that takes sort of the all of our strengths um into account so it's like what will happen is usually fox will bring like the bones of a song or like a, a fairly like worked on song and we'll all get in a room and we'll listen to it and we'll be like, this is what I would change. This is what I would add stuff like that. Um, and obviously there's like a lot of like back and forth that goes between that. Cause obviously everyone wants their own vision to be um, the final product, you know, but something I've really enjoyed um, throughout writing the album with Fox and Taylor is that when we all get in a room, and we're all, and I'm like, this is what I think the song should be. And it doesn't turn out to be quite that. And Fox is like, this is what I think should be. It doesn't turn out to be quite that. It takes like all of us. And then you look at the song at the end of it and you're like, this is way better than I could have imagined with my own. Singular. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's the, part of the whole point of being in a band is that we all have fairly different influences. But at the end of the day, we all make a song that all three of us would love to hear. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think something really cool about it too, at least for me, is like I didn't I don't know theory like when I'm playing guitar and like writing songs and then like Taylor's like what are you playing here it's like I don't know like I have no idea so for me like for for me I don't have any experience in that realm I really just kind of write what my ears think sounds good you know what I mean Mm -hmm. um but for Brandon and Taylor like they come into it with all this experience and all this knowledge that I have no idea about and it's like it really does add a whole extra layer of like complexity to the songwriting that I could never really do on my own. Yeah. Uh, so it's cool. I like it. And yeah, to expand on Brandon's point, like there's a huge like uh, you really have to like swallow your ego and like get over yourself and just be like like even if I don't think this is gonna sound good, I'm gonna try it anyways. Yeah. And then maybe it does. And like Brandon said, maybe it does. But you just go from there, and then, like, yeah, when you look at the end product, it's like, damn, this is awesome. Yeah, yeah, I, that's the that's the secret to uh, longevity of a band, I think, is just uh, the ability to allow yourself to try things that you think aren't going to work. And sometimes yeah. they do, and sometimes they don't, but, like, as a collective, like, I might come in with something and be like, I think this would sound really cool. And then once we try it, I might say, no, this doesn't work. I don't like it. Yeah. You know? 
Uh, yeah. Speaking of like you guys um, hearing the Darkness song, uh, I'm personally a big fan of Nickelback. <laughs> but uh, if you listen to some of their interviews, uh, their biggest song, like their Darkness song, would have been uh, How You Remind Me. And yeah. after they, that, they came out with that, that's when they started studying. They studied that song super hard. Like, what was it about this song that everybody likes, you know? So I think, uh, right. you know, if you have a popular song, it's definitely not trying to co- copy what it is, but there is some kind of formula that you didn't know that you were using, you know, that's there. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, and that's probably your most uh, Deftones esque song, I would say. Yeah, I would definitely say so. Repping the Death Tones. Yeah. Too, that's fine. Yeah, there's, uh, and then... Yeah, there was, there was a lot of elements about Darkness that were actually super intentional. Like, like, the whole reason I did put that on TikTok and, like, the demo and I did show that on there was because I knew it would blow up. <laughs> like, I was like, this is just a shitty little demo on my phone, but I bet if I put the right hashtag, like, I did, like, hashtag shoegaze, like, hashtag Death Tones, and it blew up. Really? And I was like... I it was, yeah, it was it was a very intentional like marketing thing. Uh, I mean, I definitely didn't know. There was no way for me to know for sure, but I was like, I was seeing a lot of stuff in that like era in that little time frame do very, very well, and I was like, this might be a time to you know seize that wave to ride that wave. So yeah, it's really cool. Yeah. So so obviously a big influence on you is Deftones. Well, what about you, Brandon and Taylor? Uh, as far as uh, songwriting in general, um, and, and drumming especially for me, it's mostly anything that Dave Grohl is a part of. Yeah. I'm a fan of seeing anything that he hasn't been a huge part of that I haven't loved. Um, just cause I, I emulate a lot of, of his playing and my playing and obviously a lot of other influences too. Um, and Muse is a really big one too. Cause that's, I've, I had never been in a three piece before this band. So seeing, I mean, the, monstrous noise they can make with only three people and it, it's all about you know selecting those moments to play the same thing and also being really individual so i'd say yeah yeah rolls in and muse and nine inch nails those are huge for me yeah what about you taylor um yeah well my favorite band ever is paramore i think the influence from them is more of like their the evolution and their sound as they progress mm-hmm. regardless of what their fan base is um in terms of bass playing and stuff i really like manchester orchestra and those riffs and the stuff that they create yeah i don't think i've heard really them cool. before what do you say i don't think i've heard manchester orchestra before really yeah i'll have to check I them out that one song that's like uh it's called The Mine. You would the probably, gold. The Gold. Yeah, you would probably recognize it. Yeah, it's a yeah. very famous song, but oh, yeah. they're kind of like one. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> they're really good, too. Yeah. Yeah, and in terms of stage presence inspiration, I really like Tina Weymouth from Talking Heads, and I get that comparison a lot, and I don't know if it's an insult or what, but it's cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Uh, speaking of a three-piece, uh... What? Well, before we get on to that, so like, I, I think I had, um, so in Bong Water, I was, well, one, it's really hard for me to get into new music, but I did actually enjoy your guys' music a lot, and I think that's probably just a product of like, you know, when you're young, you're very impressionable, and music just hits you right in the chest, right. and then when, it's harder when you're older, so you have to be really good when, when you're older trying to listen to music. But uh, right. Bongwater had some very, like, Chris Cornell uh, vocals, I thought. Mm, yeah, yeah. Grunge was, like, overall, okay, so, like, to really, I think to put it in the best words, it's like, like I said, I only started learning guitar when I was, like, 13, 14. And I wasn't super serious about it. Like, when I say getting into guitar, I meant, like, I was learning, like, Jason Mraz, like, acoustic covers. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So when I did finally start getting into rock was way closer to my like junior, senior year. And like I said, I don't really know a lot of theory. I don't know a ton of chords. So all I do is I play in drop D so I can just use one finger and it's super easy for me to articulate. And what that kind of like blended into was that Nirvana and that grunge like style of music I was listening to in that playing. It, it like a bunch of the riffs I was making just sounded like Nirvana, which, you know, whatever, it wasn't that big of a deal, but there was a ton of grunge influence on C-section. 
as a whole. Like vocally, guitar wise, like mixing wise. I mean, it's a very like dirty album, so it was very grungy. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it definitely paved like a good foundation for us as a band and our sound moving forward because like with this next release, it's way more like rock, I guess. Yeah, know. and I would say like with C section, it's like. Although we did really come off super strong with the grunge vibes, it's like you said, there was a ton of influence in there. Like, yeah. New Song 5 is a way more shoegazy-esque song, and then Techno Beats is very danceable. Yeah. And I hope that, like, what we have solidified already, even being so young and, like, being so early into our careers, is that, like, we are a very heavily uh, evolved... Yeah. Like, we evolve a lot. Like, our music style, and it changes, and it has changed a lot so far. Like, comparing Evergreen to our most recent single, 888, is, like, very two different styles and genres, and I don't think that's anything we're ever going to stop yeah. doing. And even coming into the band, and I think Brandon can say the same, because there was such a variety of sound and influences within C-section, it definitely created, like, a broader area of what we can contribute musically. Yeah, I would say that's a good good nice. view on yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of punk uh, sounds in, yeah. in C-section. And, uh, yeah. and I did have a question about, um, before we talk about uh, 888, uh, <clears throat> the window MP3, was that recorded a different yeah. way, or how was that? Yeah, so it's actually uh, our old drummer at the time, me and him were just jamming around, and I hit record on my iPhone on the voice memo thing, and I just played the chords and I improvised all of the lyrics like everything you hear on window is completely improvised which is why there's a part like three quarters of the way through the song where he's like play an F sharp and I'm like I don't know that and he was like put your finger here and then there's like a 30 second pause and then I play it and it's just like it's just a really pure recording and I just fucking liked it so I was like I'm gonna put it on the album yeah I thought it was great too that's why I was yeah. like I put it on here I was like this is really good but it's different yeah. than the rest of this yeah exactly yeah. And there's elements of that that we want to include on, like, like there's still elements of punk and, like, grunge and whatnot that we're still trying to find ways to incorporate into our newer songs. Like, there's still, like, we still want to have an acoustic song on this next album that is super different, and so there's always going to be something that carries on through, which is cool. Yeah, the um, Darkness acoustic version is probably uh, one of my favorites. Uh, I, I really enjoyed the acoustic I version. Song. You what? <laughs> Dude, I don't know. Something about the way I did the vocals on that, man. I just hate it. No, it sounds good. Like stuff like that. I think it's really. But yeah. he's just he's always like very perfectionist about his recordings and stuff, and that was like a more live recording. So it, it's it's really good, but he's I, never gonna. Yeah, I think you tapped into something on that live recording for sure. Uh, and the Thanks. song, um, like the song Frankenstein. I, the only note that I have down here is that it was like a perfectly put together song. Is that like one of your guys' yeah. personal favorites or anything? No. So actually, Frankenstein was a song we made, and uh, I was never able to come up with the melody. So we actually had a friend named Parker do the vocals on it. Um, and man, he just butchered that, in my opinion. Like, I personally, I love the structure of the song. Like, I agree with you. Like, I love the way the song is outlaid, and God, I wish I would have been able to come up with some lyrics for that, because now I hate it. Like, I yeah, hate really? that he's on that track. Well, you can always I redo it. I say it that way, but, and I'm glad you do like it, and I'm glad you do love it, and that means a lot to me. Yeah, um, I thought, like, I thought, like, oh, this is something that was, like, put together really yeah, well. It was very, like, uh, very intentional with the, like, with the interesting structure. Um, yeah, I've always loved, I always loved playing that song live the most. That was really one of my favorites to play live, but we just kind of stopped after a while. Yeah. Uh, so getting into 888, uh, so obviously that's, did, Taylor, did you have a lot of influence on that bass parts in this, or was it already? That was, that was before me. Oh, really? The, yeah. uh, yeah. the, uh, 888 was pretty much, like, 99% me, and then Brandon, we came in and did the drums in one day, and it was like, yeah. it was together really perfectly. Yeah, yeah it was you, like two weeks before my time. Right? Wow, yeah. Do you guys listen to Corn? Was that an influence on that song? Yeah, it was a, it, I like Corn a lot, but it was just a very, like, in general, a very new metal influence. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's what I put yeah. down here, new metal, cor kind of Corn yeah. vibe. Yeah, you, especially, cool. I think the only thing that's kind of separating it from, uh, from like, oh wow, this is a Corn riff 
is really just Fieldy's slap bass on it. Dun, yeah. dun, 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 dun. You know? If you yeah, did yeah, that yeah, on there. it, I think it would be almost like, wow, they are very corn influenced. I mean, you can hear right. corn on it or a new metal vibe, but like, uh, not that. And then, I'm, what is it? And an aspect of that song that I like, I don't know, no one ever really, uh, like, it is super new metal. But another like huge influence for me when it came to like mixing and doing the vocals for that song was like a lot of modern metal bands like Bad Omens and Bring Me the Horizon and stuff. Mm-hmm. Like I as much as new metal as that song was, when it came down to the mixing, I didn't want it to sound new metal at all. Like yeah. I wanted it to be very modern and very like full. Full sounding, um, yeah. In, so, pro- yeah. in the production process. Yes, yeah. Y- yeah, the production process plays a huge role. In the sound, uh, and you know, I found that out for myself uh, when I had my buddy mix and master my stuff, and uh, mm. and it, and I let him have full freedom, full control, creative freedom, because he's and and I let him write the drum parts. I wrote drum parts, but I let him do whatever drum parts he wanted to do. So he rewrote all the drum parts and everything. And uh, like you guys mentioned earlier, when when all three of you come together to write something afterwards, oh, you're this is really good. It's yeah. just like I sent him that stuff. He sent it back, and I was like, "My mind would have never thought to do this with this song, but I love it absolutely." Exactly. So exactly, yeah, yeah, it's really good. I think to I don't know if you guys are producing yourselves, but it's really good to have yeah, another. I do hint. the I do the production. I've done the production production for everything up until from Dream Eater up until Eight Eight Eight. So, and I'm also doing the production for the next project. Yeah, nice. Yeah, you got to practice to to get it good. But you, I mean, Eight 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 obviously did great, and and so did Darkness. Uh, so, so a three piece. Have you guys? So why a three piece? Uh, well, I mean, originally there was it wasn't really a choice. It was kind of just the way it, things fell into place. But I think that over time I really started to enjoy the dynamic of a three piece because it made everything way easier. Like it was, it was less complicated. There was less, you know, like less to rely on in a sense. Yeah. Um, but obviously with being a three piece, there's a huge aspect of sound compensation, especially live. Uh, any of that can be replicated, you know, in the studio and buffed up and, you know, that's not really an issue when it comes to recording, but translating that to a live setting is can be a super difficult thing so you know there are things in my setup with my guitars and with my pedals and my amps that i've that i'm working on to try and compensate and make it sound like there's two guitars um we're working on you know like beefing up the bass to really get like an octave in there to make it sound like there's it just more full yeah um and it and it honestly comes out more than anything in our energy is where the most compensation has to come from because i've seen six piece five piece bands stay in there like statues and it's like well they sound really good but this sucks and they have nowhere to they have nowhere to move on the stage they have nowhere to walk around but if you've seen any of our live footage or seen us live like we get moving man like we leave those shows hurting so yeah yeah. terribly wrong yeah Yeah. exactly (laughs) so i don't know i feel like we do a pretty good job of compensating for it and at this point I don't know. I think we would consider the possibilities of adding extra members maybe if we ever got so big to like doing arenas or something and like we wanted another guitar. Like touring members. Yeah, like touring members. But I think we just like being a three piece and I yeah. think there's a lot of strength in that as well. Um, and it's nice to not always have an even vote too. Yeah, that I was about to say, I bet in that process, having, you know, yeah. just three to kind of offset the voting process would be mm-hmm. beneficial. Happens a lot. Yeah. Uh, all right, guys. I think that's um, all. Really, all the questions I have. You guys have any other inputs you want to say or anything? I just wanted to say thanks for reaching out, and yeah. I'm really glad that you enjoyed the music the way you did, and it means a lot to us to you took your time to do this interview with yeah, us. Yeah, it's really cool the um, lesser known stuff that you brought up in the conversation. Yeah, that's like very special for us. <laughs> yeah, it's really sick. Oh yeah, yeah. I listened to it for sure. You know, picking it apart and. And uh, there seems to be a, a small wave of uh, Death Tones esque kind of bands starting to pop up with with your generation, and uh, yeah. so it's just super interesting because uh, I don't know Death Tones is kind of a would be considered an old band at this point I think with you guys so yeah no 
Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, so uh, uh, where do you guys want people to listen to your music or find you or anything? Yeah, so you can find us on Instagram at sweet underscore spine. Um, and our music is out everywhere under the name Sweet Spine on all streaming platforms. Um, and feel free to send us messages and give us your feedback and uh, critiques, and we will be more than happy to read them. Awesome, guys. Last question I just popped in my head. How did you come up with the name Sweet Spine? Oh, yeah. So, so Okay, so this goes back to, like, junior year, senior year. I was in math class, and, like, I've always doodled. Like, I used to get in trouble in school for, like, drawing up my SATs and, like, my tests and stuff because I would just love to doodle. Um, and I was in math class my 12th grade year, and I was doodling, and I was, start you know, wanting to start a band, so I wrote band names, and literally I just wrote Sweet Spine, and I never touched it again. And I just never came up with another band name, so <laughs> yeah. we kind of got stuck with Sweet Spine. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. Uh, this has been awesome. Uh, I'll definitely have you on again if I keep, you know, doing this. When your album comes out, let's for yeah. sure do an interview, and we can talk about that. Yeah. All right, guys. Yeah. Later. Thank you for your time, man. Oh, yeah, yeah, no problem. You. Go sit down. Everything Music with Derek Mitchell.